I haven't been on this stage presenting anything since fall of 2015, which is when I gave my senior capstone presentation in this room when it was uh, this building was brand new. So this is kind of fun to be able to come up here and do this again. Um, I would like to ask Dr. Abraham if she would open us out in prayer and then we'll get started. Dear loving Lord, thank you for this beautiful day um, and just for life. Thank you, Lord, for our shared passion for you, um, your creation. And Lord, we, we really thank you for the wisdom and knowledge and discernment you give us, Lord, to uh, think and, and put our thoughts into action. Lord, I just pray for our speaker today, um, for Michael, as he shares whatever he's going to share with us. Lord, I pray that you help us to really uh, think deeply about what we're hearing and apply it to our lives in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Uh, well, thank you, Pastor Alden, for inviting me to come do this talk. Thank you all for being here. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you all about the ecology of food production systems. And this is the first in a two part series on this topic. The second part will be, I believe on Thursday, uh, March 9th at 4.15 p.m. in this room. And I encourage you guys to come out to that one because today's talk is really going to set up the talk for the next month. So today I'm gonna be introducing some problems and consequences and then I'll be introducing some possible solutions to those problems in the next talk. So I also want to point out that I'm going to focus on food production as it relates to crops and plant species, not necessarily animal species, just because that would be too complex and involved the amount of time that we have. So I'm not here to talk to you guys about why a dozen chicken eggs are more than a pound of ground beef and cost. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and get started. And because ecology is such a central part of what I'll be talking to you guys about today, um, would someone from the audience like to attempt a good definition of what ecology is? What is ecology? Yeah, that's a, a good way to put it. Um, I would put it something like this, where ecology is the study of how organisms interact with other organisms and their environment. And ecology can be studied on multiple different scales. So you can look at um, organismal ecology, where you're looking at just one individual species. You could look at population ecology, where you're looking at a whole bunch of different individuals of the same species. You could look at community ecology, which talks about the different, uh, different species and how they interact all the way up to ecosystem ecology, which is how different communities of species interact. But regardless of the scale at which you're looking at ecology, there are two things that are central to ecology, and those are diversity and connections. So we'll start with diversity. So diverse ecosystems are, they're rich, they're full of life, and they are really resilient. And humans, I think, intrinsically, we like diversity. So imagine going to a zoo and you see 20 different species of animals. Imagine going to a different zoo and you see just one animal. Maybe it's a camel or something like that. Which experience are you going to enjoy more? The first Depends one. how awesome the camel is, right? <laughs> um, yeah, definitely the first one. And for those of you that like going to the beach and looking for shark teeth and fossils and shells, how many of you would go to a new beach and then go back and tell your friend or roommate, went to the most awesome beach, I found one kind of shell and that was it. <laughs> Humans just intrinsically like diversity, and I think that goes back all the way to Genesis. If you think of when God brought the animals to Adam to name them, uh, that's a good example of diversity. If you imagine if God had just brought, just created one kind of animal, brought it to Adam, he's like, what are you going to name it? And he says, I don't know, bear. And he's like, okay, enjoy, that's it. <laughs> no, so diversity is something that um, humans really enjoy and we get a psychological benefit from diversity. Um, but beyond the benefit to people, diversity really fosters resilience in an ecosystem. So um, to understand this, it helps to understand ecological niches or niches if you want to sound more fancy. Um, an ecological niche is basically a resource that can be exploited by different organisms. So a classic example, is plants that produce trumpet-shaped flowers. Those flowers are a floral resource that provides nectar as a food source for things like hummingbirds. 
right? Because hummingbirds have that long, narrow beak, they can exploit that resource. So what happens in a system where you have all of these trumpet-shaped flowers, plants with trumpet-shaped flowers, and just one species of hummingbird that pollinates it, and nothing else can pollinate those plants? What happens to the ecosystem if that one species of hummingbird goes extinct? It dies. Yeah. Yeah, so the hummingbird goes extinct, but it's not good for those plants either, right? Now imagine the same scenario, except instead of one species of hummingbird, there are three or four or five or six different species of hummingbirds. Now what happens if one hummingbird goes extinct? Not much. You're going to preserve that functional, uh, that functional role of those flowers in that ecosystem. And because there are multiple different hummingbird species that can exploit that resource, um, this is what we call functional redundancy, and it's really, really important in helping ecosystems to be resilient. So the long and short of it is that diversity fosters um, ecosystems that are rich, they're full of life, and they are resilient. Now let's talk about connectivity. So diversity feeds into connectivity, and an ecosystem that is diverse, all the moving parts and pieces and species in that ecosystem are going to form all of these uh, vast webs of interconnectedness among each other. And that also helps ecosystems be resilient. So an easy way to sort of demonstrate this is to picture, picture a spider web, just a single strand spider web from one point to another point, and there's just one web between them. That represents a system that is not very diverse. Now imagine a system that the web looks more like a black widow spider web. I don't know if you guys have ever seen those, but there are connections everywhere. So it might be connected to a plant over here and a tree over here, and then all of those webs interact and connect in all these different ways. Which of those webs is going to be easier to break? The first one. The first one, right. Um, assuming that those webs are all of equal strength and everything, the first one is easier. Um, so another really cool example of connectivity in ecosystems actually is illustrated by James Cameron's first Avatar movie. How many of you saw that one? <laughs> Aside from, uh, well, it was a, first of all, it was a beautiful movie at the time when it first came out. It had a really cliche storyline, I know, but um, there was a part in the movie when they talked about trees having the ability to communicate through their roots using electrical signals. They actually weren't too far off. So. A lot of research suggests that trees can communicate with each other through their roots, um, especially in forested ecosystems. And this is largely facilitated, at least in our current understanding, by webs of fungi that live in the soil. Uh, these fungi are called mycelium, and all of these mycelia helped, help to connect all of these roots of trees in a system. So what happens is, let's say you coppice or pollard a tree. Coppicing is cutting off the main trunk at the ground. Pollarding is cutting it off at, I don't know, like head level or something. The tree that you coppice or pollard will send hormonal signals through its roots to the trees nearby that basically tell the trees, I just had my head or most of my body, all my leaves cut off. I'm not going to be photosynthesizing much anytime soon. Why don't you guys use the nutrients that are here to grow? So what happens is, when you coppice or pollard a tree in a system, usually the immediate response of the trees around it is to grow um, at a faster rate because of that hormonal communication among the tree's roots. It actually gets more complicated than that. So if a certain tree is lacking, say, magnesium ions, it can send a signal through the roots and through this mycelial network to ask other trees for excess magnesium ions that they have and those trees can send those ions through the fungal network to that tree, sometimes in exchange for calcium or something like that. Um, so there's this really complex interconnected web of life going on in the soil that we're just now barely beginning to understand. It needs a lot more research. But overall, um, this mycelial network has been described as a soil brain because it's so complex and the amount of connections actually um, are similar to a neural network in the brain. So 
At this point, I kind of want to walk you guys through quickly the ecology of a system. And let's start with plants. What do plants eat? What do they need? Yeah, so they need micronutrients, they need oxygen, some of said, they need carbon, right? What else? Light, water. Yeah, light, water. What are the three main plant nutrients? Does anybody know? Nitrogen. Anybody? The big three are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. NPK. Those are the three most important nutrients that plants need. So if you ever look at a bag of soil or fertilizer, usually it has three numbers on it. It might be like 10, 10, 10, or 8, 4, 8, or something like that. Those are just the ratios of nitrogen and phosphorus to potassium that the plants need. But plants also need a whole bunch of other micronutrients. I think Gavin mentioned it. Um, these include things like iron and calcium and magnesium and cobalt and selenium and zinc and all of these different uh, micronutrients in the soil. So plants can grow using just nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but they really thrive when they get all of those micronutrients as well. So where do plants get these nutrients from? Soil. Soil, yeah. So if you ever look at a solar particle under a microscope, it kind of looks like a lava rock or something or a meteorite has all of these divots and holes um, and irregularities in the surface that act as binding sites for these mineral nutrients in the soil. The problem is plants can't access nutrients that are bound to soil particles. So the way that I like to think of it is these mineral ions like uh, sodium and calcium and potassium, magnesium and so on, they're bound to a soil particle like magnets on a fridge. What do you have to do to get a magnet off? Yeah, you have to apply a force, you have to expend energy to pull it off. Plants can't do that. Anybody have any ideas how plants can get nutrients off of soil particles like this? So let's, uh, let me rephrase the question. What's one thing that plants are really good at doing using sunlight? Yeah, photosynthesis, right? <laughs> Which is where they take carbon dioxide and they use sunlight energy to uh, combine carbon dioxide into water to make sugar. And what plants do, I don't know if you guys know this, but up to 40% of the sugars that they produce through photosynthesis, they don't actually use to build their tissues. They pump them into the ground um, in the form of root exudates. So root exudates, the way I like to think of them are basically like little sugary uh, morsels, if you will, like donuts, almost. It's like they pump donuts into the soil to attract donut-eating microbiology, um, things like bacteria and fungi, protozoa, but primarily bacteria. So plants excrete these root exudates into the ground to attract these bacteria in the soil, and those bacteria are able to peel off those nutrients from soil particles. Um, through a process called chelation. So um, the more plants that you have in a system, the more of that is going to occur. Now different kinds of plants produce different kinds of root exudates to attract different kinds of soil microbiota to attract different types of nutrients. Um, and those uh, bacteria, they don't live as long as plants, right? So they bring those nutrients with them and then they die and those nutrients are available for plants to use. So the greater the diversity of plants in a system, the greater the diversity of root exudates, the greater the diversity of soil microbiota, and the greater diversity of nutrients are available to plants. Does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. So plants are really, really important for the health of the soil. And the greater the diversity of plants, the better. Now let's go above the ground and think about what happens if you have a diverse uh, set of plants in a system. They're going to attract a diverse set of invertebrates, things like insects and spiders. 
That includes both pests of those plants, but also predatory insects, things like um, mantids and dragonflies. And probably the most important in an agricultural context are wasps. Wasps are phenomenal predators of a lot of insect pests. Really, really, really super important ecologically. As you go further up the system, that diversity of invertebrates attracts a diversity of insect eating species, things like birds and so on. And those uh, birds attract higher predators like hawks and falcons. And you can build an entire system that is very rich ecologically by starting with a rich and diverse array of plants. Does that make sense? So really healthy ecology comes down to having a healthy diversity of plants because it helps create all of these diverse connections that make the ecosystem resilient. So how are the majority of first world staple crops produced? Anybody know? They're usually grown in fields like this. Um, fields like this are monoculture, which just simply means one crop, um, because they're grown with one single crop species in a field uh, at a given time. And I would make the claim that the modern focus on monoculture began during the Industrial Revolution at a time when we really didn't understand soil ecology the way that we do today. What we did understand was that plants need nitrogen in order to be green. Nitrogen is a central component of chlorophyll that makes them green. And so up until about 1910 or so in the US, the main sources of nitrogen fertilizer were from mining saltpeter, which is potassium nitrate, and bat guano, usually from tropical islands. Then in 1910 or so, the Haber-Bosch process was invented. The Haber-Bosch process is an industrial um, chemical reaction that takes atmospheric nitrogen gas and converts it into ammonia-based fertilizer. So just like plants can't take nutrients from soil particles, plants can't use the abundance of nitrogen gas in the atmosphere because nitrogen gas is diatomic and those two nitrogens are stuck together and plants physically can't separate them. So this industrial process can separate those, turn them into ammonia-based fertilizers, which can then uh, be added uh, to the soil. To give you an idea of the scale at which this process takes place, as of 2018, the Haber-Bosch process produces somewhere around the order of 500 billion pounds of ammonia-based fertilizer every year. So it's a, it's a hugely important process for, uh, for growing food. That, by the way, does use about 5% of the world's natural gas supply as well to, to catalyze that reaction. And that process has been called the detonator of the human population explosion. Because in 1910, the human population globally was around 1.6 billion. And in the 100 years or so since, we've, I think, just eclipsed 8 billion. And a, a large portion of that is because this process of ammonia production allowed us to produce a whole lot more quantity, not necessarily quality, but a whole lot more quantity of food. And that was really important because uh, what two major world events happened shortly after 1910? Heard a whole bunch of different answers. <laughs> world War One. Yeah, World War One and World War Two. Um, and in times of war, it helps to have food security where you can grow a lot of food really cheaply. Um, and it led to a dramatic shift in the way that agriculture was approached um, globally, but it did have some great results. Like I said, you can grow a lot of food cheaply using this process, um, and then you have that food security in times of war as well. Um, so to give you an idea of kind of the shift in agricultural mentality uh, before and after this process. Um, in 1910, right before this kind of uh, took off, there were about six and a half million farms in the US and roughly 30% of the US labor force worked on a farm. This had actually decreased, believe it or not, since the 1820s when it was estimated that around 70% of the US labor force worked on a farm. And a lot of that had to do with industrialization a lot more job opportunities became available. Does anybody have any idea what proportion of the U.S. workforce today works on a farm? Who 
The most recent estimate is 1.3%. And so um, since 1910, those six and a half million farms have been consolidated into two million farms, and the average farm size has more than doubled in that time period. And of course, the amount of people working on a farm has also dramatically decreased. And a large uh, proportion of that has to do with monoculture, but it also has to do with the availability of equipment like tractors that can harvest a field much more quickly than humans can. And that also feeds into monoculture because if you have a field of corn and you develop a machine to harvest corn, it's more efficient to harvest a field of corn that's just corn than it is to harvest a field of corn that has beans and other things growing on it. So modern agriculture is really focused on monoculture for these reasons. And usually these fields, which in the US, the major uh, crops, anyone have any guesses on what the major crops are in the US? Corn. Yep, corn is up there. What else? Corn, wheat. Not really potatoes. Yeah, soybeans are really important. Um, and rice to a lesser extent. They're all usually grown in these monoculture fields intensively year after year after year. And sometimes cover crops are used in between. Uh, some states actually have laws where it's illegal to grow more than one crop in a field um, over a calendar year. I think um, Iowa just changed that where now you can grow two different crops in the same field in a given year. Um, but anyway, what this ends up doing is it kind of neglects the biblical principle of a fallow year. Uh, that comes from Exodus 23, 11, uh, where God commands the Israelites to leave their fields unplowed and unused every seventh year. And that includes not just agricultural fields, but also orchards and vineyards and so on. And it's actually really, really good agricultural advice. So of course the Israelites didn't necessarily understand why or how it works. Today we know that what happens is if you leave the land untouched, birds and animals bring a whole diversity of seeds of weeds and other things. This diversity of plants pumps a diversity of root exudates into the ground, which attracts a diversity of soil microbiota, which essentially refertilizes the soil, um, just like we were talking about earlier. Unfortunately, most farms don't do that because it's not efficient to do that. So what they do is they apply chemical fertilizers like the ammonia produced by the Haber-Bosch process. But around 50 to 80 percent of agricultural fertilizers actually run off into local waterways, and those fertilizers cause algae blooms of huge, enormous quantities of algae. When those algae die, what happens? They have to be broken down, and decomposition uses up a lot of oxygen, especially in the water column where oxygen is already in such short supply anyway, and it depletes the oxygen in the water column. It can cause fish die-offs and everything like that. So in grad school, I studied fisheries along the Mississippi River, and this eutrophication, we could see it all the time. It was a, a cyclical sort of seasonal process where you get these huge algae blooms in the summer because of the application of fertilizers, and these fertilizers would run off into the streams, the streams would concentrate those fertilizers into the smaller rivers, which would concentrate them into the larger rivers, uh, most of which would flow into the Mississippi River, and then down eventually into the Gulf of Mexico. So every year, the Gulf of Mexico, um, just off the southern coast of Louisiana, has a dead zone where the water at the bottom of the ocean is so depleted of oxygen that nothing can live at that depth. Um, Last year, in 2022, this dead zone was about uh, 3,200 square miles in size, uh, just to give you some perspective on that. The year before, it was about twice that size. So just to give you kind of a, a visual of how big of an area this is, imagine walking from Tampa all the way across the state of Florida to the East Coast over by Melbourne, and as you walk that path, 15 miles to your left and 15 miles to your right, the entire ocean floor is devoid of life. So that's a pretty major impact of using industrial fertilizers. So 
Let's step back for just a second and look at the ecology of one of these monoculture fields. So, first of all, what's the plant diversity in a monoculture field? Low. One? Yeah, very low. So what's the diversity of root exudates in a monoculture field? Not necessarily one, but it's gonna be really, really low. Um, so what's going to be the diversity of available nutrients in the soil? Also really, really low. And so remember, uh, these nutrients aren't naturally chelated in the soil unless the right soil microbiota are there attracted by a diversity of plant groups. And so those nutrients have to be added either as fertilizers, um, and usually they focus on nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium because that's what plants need to grow. Sometimes they'll add trace elements, but typically um, not because plants can usually get by without them. So the end result is you get food that is, after 100 years or so of this process, that is grown in fields that are depleted of trace nutrients. And so most of the nutrients that they get are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which makes them grow bulkier, but they don't have as much nutritional content. So one study I read um, estimated that you would have to eat eight oranges today to get the same nutritional content of eating one orange from 50 years ago. And the numbers are actually substantially larger for vegetable crops, carrots in particular. Um, you'd have to eat a whole lot of carrots today to get the same nutritional content um, as from back then. Also because of this reduced nutritional content and greater, greater bulk but less nutrition, um, you have to eat more to feel full. So um, that could also in some ways contribute to uh, weight gain and obesity as well. Um, think about this too. Throughout history, most food was grown and consumed locally. But with the advent of industrial agriculture growing food in these monoculture fields, we've kind of shifted away from growing food at the household, local, and community scale toward growing large quantities of, of monoculture crops far away from the end consumer. So one study I read found that um, on average, the average piece of produce travels 1,300 miles from its point of origin before it's consumed uh, by people. Imagine how much gas we could save if we grew food and ate it locally, right? Also, because of this long distance that most uh, fruits and vegetables have to travel, varieties of crops, fruits and vegetables are chosen um, for their shelf life, their ability to be shipped long distances without bruising or spoiling easily, and for their appeal to the final consumer uh, through color and texture and that sort of thing, whether the color is real or artificial. So things like um, flavor and nutritional content become secondary considerations. So really, if you want to grow a diversity of food that is nutritious but also tastes good, because I don't know if you guys have ever eaten a mango fresh from the tree, it's totally, totally different than a mango that you eat from the store. Um, if you want to eat food like that, you basically have to grow it yourself these days. Um, and that'll give a little bit of a hint of what the next talk will be talking about. So let's step back and look again at the ecology of the monoculture field. We talked about the soil health. Let's talk about the pest diversity. What kind of diversity of Insect pests might there be in a monoculture field? Yeah, pretty low. What about the diversity of predatory insects like wasps? <clears throat> also pretty low, right? There's not much plant diversity. And so if you have like a monoculture field of corn and a corn pest insect finds that field, it hits the jackpot because there's an endless supply of corn and little to no natural uh, predatory pest control from those insects. So what does, what does the farmer have to do in that case to prevent the corn from being destroyed? Yeah, use insecticides to treat it. What if you have um, this monoculture field of corn and you get weeds that start to grow? How do you address that? Roundup. <laughs> Hopefully not round up. <laughs> um, but yeah, herbicides, um, not all farmers do that, but herbicides can be applied as well. Um, you guys ever see where you buy fruit from the store and it has on the container wash before eating or rinse before eating? Mm -hmm. That's why, because of herbicides and pesticides. 
So all of this combined, if you put this together, um, whether it's intentional or realized or not, all of these practices in a monoculture field maximize or rather minimize the amount of uh, diversity at all levels, crop diversity, insect diversity, and so on. Um, there was a, and by the way, this is the main method of food production for crops to grow today. There was a study uh, done in 2021 by Benton and his colleagues that found that food production is the primary threat to 86% of the species that are at risk of extinction globally. So I'll repeat that, that food production is the primary threat of extinction for 86% of the species that are threatened with extinction globally. So growing food in monoculture fields like this is arguably the greatest threat to biodiversity loss and extinction of species on the planet. So ultimately what we've done is we've developed a philosophy, kind of an approach to farming, if you will, that places value on these monoculture systems because they're um, cost effective and efficient and produce high yields. Um, but in the process, we're killing biodiversity um, that helps ecosystems to be resilient. We're adding pesticides and herbicides to our diet, reducing the nutritional quality of our food and disconnecting ourselves from how our food is produced. So these are just a few of the consequences of separating our knowledge of ecology from how we produce our food. And I know I took not as much time as I have, but that was kind of intentional because I wanted to leave time for questions. So that's all I have for now. What I'll do in the next talk is introduce um, some possible solutions to this problem. And I'll walk you guys through some various food production systems across the globe, uh, both in ancient times and modern times. Some that have been in place for over 2,000 years that produce food very effectively in these diverse systems. And um, I'll try to encourage you guys to grow your own food in diverse systems. Thank you. So you would say shop locally for your fruits and vegetables and yeah that, that's a, a good place to start i heard someone say one time if it's in a box and has an ingredients list don't eat it <laughs> i wouldn't go to that extreme but i would i would say try to eat food that's grown locally as much as, as much as you can and i encourage you all i know most of you are in college right now and can't grow food but once you graduate i do encourage you to grow food in your own backyard especially if you're here in florida it is super um, you can go to Walmart and buy a bag of like thousands of black eyed pea seeds for like 60 cents and you can put them out in the yard right before the rainy season not even have to worry about watering them and you'll get tons and tons of black eyed peas which you can eat as a green bean, you can eat it dried later, super super easy to grow food. I didn't think those seeds are not modified for mutating or zones that are um, popping up in the Gulf, or are we just letting it happen? Um, there are agencies that are aware of it, but there's only so much you can do unless you change the source of the inputs. Um, there have been some recent studies, I think last fall, that 
have tried to make the Haber Bosch process more efficient, so it produces less waste in the process, but I don't think that's the right way to go. I mean, it does improve things kind of temporarily. Um, it's like trying to put a Band-Aid on, on a dying elephant or something. <laughs> but um, I think most systems, if you understand the way that the ecology works, you don't even have to add much in the way of anything at all, because systems that are grown for diversity they are, uh, they take care of themselves as far as nutrients go because of the plant diversity. They take care of themselves with pest control. Um, and so you don't have to use as many herbicides, you don't have to use as many pesticides, you can control the nutritional quality, and you can do it for basically for free. Yeah. So with the fields that are currently monoculture and like they're depleted in nutrients, how long do you think it would take if they switch for it to like start to improve? It really just depends on how they make that transition, uh, what diversity of plants they grow. So like um, different functional groups of plants will add different kinds of nutrients to the soil. So it helps to have, to kind of mimic a forest system in that you have plants of different functional roles like uh, understory trees and canopy trees and then you know root crops. And the, the greater the diversity, the, the faster that will happen. Probably the fastest way to do it is to mimic ecological succession, um, which is where you grow your pioneer plants first, things like nitrogen fixing plants. Um, let those start to establish the system first and then kind of add as you go. Yeah. I noticed like these plants here too, where all the strawberries are growing up, they have like a crop that they stand in between trees and seeds. How does that affect the soil? Cover crops are great. Um, usually it's a legume, so a nitrogen fixing plant. Again, plants can't actually use nitrogen on their own, but uh, nitrogen fixing plants in Affinity Fabulaceae will actually have a mutualistic relationship with rhizobium bacteria in their roots that will be able to take nitrogen from the atmosphere and apply it to the soil that the plant produces. So when you plant a cover crop, for one thing, you're covering the soil so you reduce evaporation and that sort of thing, but it also helps to pump nitrogen back into the ground. So it provides nitrogen and also whatever root exudates that particular crop can provide. I think personally cover, cover crops shouldn't necessarily be a single species. I think you should sow 20 different types of cover crops in the same field because um, you would increase the benefit from it. Um, one way that farmers are trying to address this is by uh, planting rows of crops on the edges of their fields and in between, um, which helps to a certain extent, but it doesn't fully solve the problem. Like I went down to South Florida in the fall and their strawberry fields down there, they were growing in between rows of sugar cane, which I thought, oh, it's better than just strawberries. <laughs> it's a step in the right direction. Yeah. Any other questions? So for someone, sorry. Okay. Um, for someone that's wanting to like go and plant their own foods and like have their own food supplies, yeah. Um, is there a certain like mixture of diversity that would be best of like different types of plants to put together? Yeah, just try to think of it almost in terms of like um, nice families. So like uh, brassicas, for instance, things like cabbage and kale and collard greens and mustard greens. They're all kind of in the same group, so they would provide similar forms of root exudates. So go for diversity of like form, um, so like smaller trees and larger trees, and they, don't forget the perennials like trees, because they are really important in the stability of the system long term. But the best advice I can give as far as getting into growing food is grow for the climate that you live in. A lot of people come down to Florida from up north and try to grow northern vegetables in a subtropical climate, and it does not work. If you're in Florida, you should grow subtropical plants. Uh, a lot of the things that have been grown historically in the South grow really well in Florida. Collard greens are phenomenal. Black eyed peas are phenomenal. Sweet potatoes are super easy. Um, this past, I think it was like May, I had a mushy sweet potato. I had been soaking in an aquarium for a long time. Don't ask why, but I buried this mushy sweet potato in the sand and didn't do anything to it. And a year later, I had like two pounds of sweet so, uh, sweet potatoes do great out here as well, but grow in the climate. George, you had a question. Oh, yeah. Um, 
So you said that trees communicate with each other through their roots. Right. Um, is that the same with like all plants? To a lesser extent. So without getting too much into the ecology of it, open systems have soil uh, microbiota that are predominantly bacterial, um, bacterial heavy in the composition of soil microbiota. As you progress from an open habitat to a forest, forested systems are predominantly fungal dominated in the soil. So there's kind of a progression as you go through that successive process. And so in a forest system with mature trees, there are more fungi in the soil that can help facilitate those connections. But in an open system, um, like a lot of non-trees, like you're talking about, like you know, tomatoes or whatever else, there's just gonna be a lower abundance of fungi in the soil, if that makes sense. So we, we're just starting to understand it in forest systems with trees with, with roots and are using the study. And I would imagine that smaller plants do something similar, but we really don't know at this point. So. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, so how exactly is the oxygen being taken from the water um, due to decomposition of the bacteria? Oh, you mean algae like in eutrophication? Yeah, the algae. Yeah, so the, the process of breaking down um, dead things uses oxygen because the decomposers need oxygen to live, basically. Oh, okay. Uh, and there's very little dissolved oxygen content in the water anyway, especially compared to the air. So if you sap a lot of that out of the water, then everything else that depends on oxygen in the water will die as well. Um, have any of you been to Circle B and walked Hancock Trail and seen a whole bunch of dead fish on the side of the road? That's from oxygen depletion because they had an algae bloom, the algae died, and it sucked all the oxygen out of the water, and the fish literally died from their injury. Yeah. Is there any way to put oxygen back in the water? Get a really big air pump <laughs> <laughs> and a really big bubbling stone. No. Um, water that moves has more oxygen in it. And to some extent, certain plants can can also add oxygen to the water, but the easiest way is to not pump a bunch of fertilizers into the water. <laughs> yeah. So why is the dead zone so much smaller this year than last year? Is it because they've made those small, small changes? I don't know. I really don't know. But it could be a change in the flow rate as well. So rainfall patterns can affect where and how much water moves in a given area. Um, so I, I really can't. other questions? If not, make sure you guys come out to the talk on uh, March 9th of next month because that will be really fun. We'll walk through some really cool uh, ecological systems from throughout time and, and across the planet and see how food has been grown in ways that actually make sense ecologically.